Okay, folks. Uh, it is 7 o'clock, which is farming our time here in PFI country. And I'm not going to waste anybody's time. We've got a lot of great content from Jeannie McEwen tonight talking about the top 10 sellers at her farm, Bright Flower Farm in Stockton, Illinois, that we're going to get to. So um, thanks for joining us. I think you all know why you tuned in. We're going to talk flowers tonight. So um, before, though, before I turn it over to Jeannie, uh, I wanted to say I'm Steve Carlson. I work with Practical Farmers of Iowa. I'm in the Practical Farmers office here in Ames, Iowa. And if you haven't got the, um, the vibe in the chat box there, it's fun to see where people are tuning in from. So please share that with us if you're interested. It looks like we've got someone from New Jersey. That's awesome. And then we got Andrew Friend, Story City. That's right next door to me. So yeah, go ahead. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And, and thanks for being here tonight. Um, but yeah, before I turn it over to Jeannie, let's talk about PFI. So this is part of our uh, fall farm in our series, and uh, this is the fourth out of our six topics for this uh, for this fall series. And we've got two more. The last two topics that we're going to do up until the end of the new year are on uh, making making cover crops profitable with livestock. So. Uh, if you're interested in livestock and cover crops, tune in next Tuesday and the Tuesday after that. We'll have some great presentations, one from a farmer in Kansas, one from in Nebraska. Um, and then we start a winter farm in our series, the first thing in January, and we're going to have another 10, maybe 11 topics all through January, all through February, and into March. Um, so again, these are all going to be Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock Central. Um, so we'll make that announcement of what those topics will be near the end of the year. Um, but if you've missed any farminars in the past, we do archive all of these farminars. So there's a link right there to our farminar archive. We literally have over like 130. So if there's a topic that you're interested in, there's a good chance it's in our farminar archive. So go there, check it out. So Practical Farmers of Iowa has been around for over 30 years now. We started in about 1985. We are a farmer-led organization. These farminars are a great example of that. We have a farmer, Jeannie, from Illinois tonight who's going to be talking about what she does on her farm. And that's what PFI does, is farmer-to-farmer -farmer education. We are a big tent, is what we call it, which means that we welcome all farming enterprises and farms of all sizes and shapes. Um, so as you saw with our farminar series, the next two topics are on livestock grazing cover crops and tonight's flowers. And so we really cover the whole spectrum of agriculture. If you can grow it or raise it in Iowa, uh, we, we try to provide programming on that if our members ask for it. Our mission at Practical Farmers is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing, which um, we do to help farmers practice in agriculture that benefits both the land and the people. And we achieve this mission through a number of ways. One of those ways is um, with our on-farm research program. We call it the Cooperators Program. We've been doing on-farm research since we started in 1985. These on-farm replicated research trials to help uh, to help you be more sustainable and more profitable. Uh, we publish all those research reports on our website, and we talk about them at our field days, and we talk about them in our farminars, in our annual conference, and we provide all of these opportunities for people to learn from each other. Uh, about what's working on their farm and what's not. So these farminars obviously are a great example of that. Also, we have our big old main event of the year. Uh, this year, our annual conference theme is Revival. It's happening January 18, 19, 19 and 20. It's always in Ames, Iowa on the IS, ISU campus. Um, we have 50-some uh, sessions planned. Again, it covers everything from you know horticulture and livestock to field crops farmland transfer, everything in between. Um, please go to that website, pficonference.org, brand new website. Go check that out and get all the details and register to come join us in Ames that weekend for our big conference. And if you like what PFI does, then you should join us. We're a member-based organization, so we want, um, we want, we're only as good and strong as our membership. So um, there's a whole host of member benefits here. You can join our email discussion groups. You can participate in our programs like our Labor for Learning program, which helps aspiring farmers get paid on-farm employment and additional training on how to run a farm business. 
You can do that if you're a member. Um, you can do our on-farm research if you're a member. But really, the main benefit of being a Practical Farmers of Iowa member is the network and, and plugging in with other people who want to share their knowledge and uh, want to help you do a better job at what you do. So uh, join our great network at Practical Farmers. You can get more information on the website again, or talk to me. Finally, then, uh, a couple of rules here before I turn it over. Uh, use that chat box to ask any questions for Jeannie or myself tonight. Um, go ahead and pop those in there. Uh, if Jeannie sees them and if it's appropriate, she'll go ahead and answer it. But otherwise, I'll make sure that we get back to your questions at the end of the night. So um, don't hesitate to ask your questions. It's, it's helpful if you keep it on topic because there's a good chance that Jeannie might cover that question a little bit later. You know, So try to keep it a little bit focused. But um, we are going to reserve. She's got maybe about an hour here to talk. And then we'll reserve about 20 to 30 minutes after that for any and all other questions. So um, keep your questions um, focused, but we'll get to everything a little bit later. Uh, be respectful to our presenter. Be respectful to other people in the chat box. And then I really would like to ask you to please take our very short, quick survey after the presentation. So you can click that link right there right now, that SurveyMonkey link. That'll open a um, you know your web browser. And then I'll, you can just, after the presentation, then go and take you know 30 seconds to fill out that survey. That's a good chance for you to tell us what topics you want to hear about in the future. And I am literally planning right now are topics for the winter series, January, February, March. So if you've got a topic that you really want to hear about, tell me about it in that survey. Also, if you take the survey, you can you can win a free hat or a PFI shirt or something like that. So a little bit more of incentive. I'll put that link back in the chat box a little bit later, though. So um, just want to, I'm going to bring it up again. I don't want to bother you too much, but please take the survey. So that's, um, that's what I've got. Thanks everybody for joining. Jeannie, I'm going to pull up your presentation now. And so whenever you, whenever you see that come up on your screen, feel free to start us off. Thank you very much. Well, hi everybody. This is the first time I've ever done a webinar, so. Um... It's, it's not hard for me to talk about flowers for an hour, so hopefully I'll uh, stay in the time frame and get your questions answered as well. It's kind of neat to see so many uh, people interested from all over the country. I'm sure where all you are, it's cold. It's been really, it's going to get really cold this week here. Jeannie, do you see your presentation pop up yet? Yep. OK, great. Yep, sound good. Thank you. OK, so um, we're going to talk about the top 10 products um, that we sell here at, in Stockton at Bright Flower. Um, I put together uh, a list, actually two years. And I was going to take a minute to explain how I did it, because um, you know, being farmers and we grow outside, we have weather to deal with. And um, some pretty dramatic things happened to us this year to affect our um, our top 10. So, and then there's a couple of little snafus that I noticed. Um, sorry about that, but you know, I'm human. Um, but but uh, in any event, in both years, you'll see that our our top our top sellers were the mason jar bouquets and our mixed bouquets. We sell only wholesale. Um, we don't have any retail um, method of selling. We don't do farmers markets. Um, they're just there aren't any good ones around here. So our primary sales um, customers are florists and grocery stores. And we sell a lot to Whole Foods. We have some independent, you know, small grocery stores. Um, so the mason jars and the mixed bouquets are, are, are obviously our biggest seller. Um, you'll see in the, um, so what I did with these colors is, uh, if you just count 1 through 10, it's the purple and the orange. And the orange and the yellow are the, are the, um, the items that we sell, and, and in the 2017, I took out the case quantities. Um, it's, it's obvious that, 
you know, if, if we're going to sell cases of things, there'll be more in the case and it would, you know, float to the top. Um, so, and you'll see like number three is the seasonal bunch. There's 10 per case over in 2016. That was number four. Um, another thing that I noticed that's a little bit of a um, overstatement is in 2016, you'll see dahlia stems as number three, and then you'll see dahlias three to five per bunch. Um, the dahlia stems five per bunch in the orange, I added in the single bunches into cases to get that 839 total quantity and $8,000. So that dahlia three to five in purple is really shouldn't be there. But anyway, so what I did was I combined these and um, I created a list of let's see, you got to hit this of the top ten that that are generally my top ten, but the top ten I wanted to talk about because um, if you get your act together growing you're going to want to be selling dahlias, ranunculus, lisianthus, peonies, um, and, and those are going to be your top. They just will. Um, so this is what I'm going to end up talking about. I also put delivery in there. Um, I don't know if you guys charge delivery, but two years ago we started and it floats right to the top and it floats right to the bottom line um, because it offsets your um, your expense your delivery expense whether it go into fuel or labor but um, and I'll talk more about it but I, I urge you all to consider um, I had to get rid of my cat there, sorry. <laughs> I urge you to consider uh, charging delivery. Okay, so mason jars. Um, just a few things about these mason jars. You'll notice that we don't really have any focal flowers here. Um, they're packed with, you know, there, there really aren't any focal flowers. Um, Sometimes we do, sunflowers maybe, but generally they're packed with flowers, foliage, textures, um, and the like. They're, these were all done by the same um, designer, so they tend to be kind of roundy moundies. Um, depending on who's do, doing them, we may have, they may be really tall and very textural. So there's, there's no formula at all, but um, required is a lot of flowers. They're not skimpy. Okay, so this year, um, we actually, I did, <laughs> again, I, I kind of flipped here, but uh, we actually sold about 5,000 um, this year. Um, and we only started them a couple of years ago. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess what I'll say then is that the, the neat thing about mason jars is that you can use up shorter stems. You can also cut full stems apart and like uh, maybe a stem of Bupleurum might have six or eight stems on it and there's lots of different flowers like that so that you can use up, you know, everything. Um, but the key here is not to skimp. We do a very simple wrap of jute twine around them to decorate them. We only sell them by the case, and depending on the store, we pack them either 15 or 12. Um, and we use a nursery carry tray um, for stability, a four-inch round carry tray. They do cost about a buck, but it's a dollar translated over 100 or 115 dollars, and the flowers are delivered gorgeously. Um, last year, or this last year, we um, we got 775 for each one. So um, it's you know wholesale is a good price. Did you lose sound again? Oh no, that's somebody else. Okay, never mind. Um, okay, so let's move on to mixed bouquets. Um, so here's just a few examples of some of our bouquets. Um, 
you know, we always do some red, white, and blue for 4th of July. Some of them are very floral. Some of them are very textural. Um, we pack our bouquets 10 per case, and we use um, the black 10-liter buckets, um, which, you know, you might be able to get for free if you can... Um, if you do work with grocery stores, um, I ended up buying a whole pallet a couple of years ago. And now we, um, I haven't bought one since and I probably won't have to because the grocery stores will save them and give us a whole s slew of them at one time. Each one of the bouquets are sleeved. Uh, they have a UPC and our logo sticker. Um, this year we started using paper sleeves. I tried both um, of the craft paper sleeves from Happy Day and from Aru. I preferred the ones from Happy Day. They're thinner. They're, they've got kind of a glossy texture to them. And they're, um, they don't dissolve in water, which the Aru ones do. The other thing with the Aru ones is that they're, they're it's almost like wrapping your, anyway, I think so, wrapping your bouquet in like cardboard. They're really stiff. Each one of our bouquets, um, okay, I just see quickly, the mason jars are, are, are pint and the, the stems, I don't know, anywhere from 9 to 15. Um, so anyway, with the mixed bouquets, um, each one of them is unique. We don't follow a formula. I have a funny story that I'll tell quickly. Um, one of my very best customers who buys tens of thousands of dollars from us each year, a grocery store customer, called me to tell me that um, she had to shrink a couple cases of my bouquets, and I was just devastated. And I said, why? And she said, well, you know, they were almost like formulaic. And that week I had tried to speed up one of my employees by giving her formulas um, and showing her how she could speed up by if she took one of these, one of these, one of these, and make the whole uh, bucket the same. And it backfired severely. So we went back to our... Um, are making of bouquets uniquely, and you know, I, I haven't had a call like that since. Generally, they each have a focal flower, but if you look at um, if you look at these, none of these really. Let's see. Let's do this here. None of these really. Come on. I guess it's not going to show. Oh, there it is. So none of these really do have focal flowers. Um, they've just got a lot of color and a lot of texture. Um, if we have, uh, you know, sunflowers or lilies or some other big, beautiful dahlias, um, we will use focal flowers. But it's it's not a necessity in our in our um, bouquets. Uh, with the Grocery stores, we have to sell an item, and the item has specifications. And so within the specifications of our bouquet, it's a 9 to 12 stem bunch. But it's really based more on heft. And generally, the, the bouquet fills a 14-inch sleeve. So they're, they're pretty good size. We have a um, processing center that I call the garden center. And um, it has a really large central counter that's just, you know, counter height. And each side is about six to seven feet. We have four people working. Each person gets a side. I have a picture of this coming up. Each person has their own bunch cutter. It fits over a garbage can. The flowers are all set out in front of us in buckets. Um, and we each work on a rubber mat. And... I've timed us because I'm a real number cruncher, and generally it takes us four minutes per bouquet, including setup and cleanup. So from the very start, you know, at 7 a.m. when we start and we close up at whatever time it is, um, our general uh, average is about four minutes. Um, 
they all get labeled in their cases for the destination and then we'll put them with the other flowers that the store that the stores are buying and delivery is the following day this is a picture of um, me in the in my space uh, looks like uh, it's probably June just generally you know looking at the flowers you can see the bunch cutter it's over the garbage can you can see the mats that we're sitting on or that we stand on um, I don't get this little arrow oh there it is um, we generally have each one of us has flowers all around us on two full sides um, so there's you know I could have 10 buckets in front of me and I end up working with my, my bouquets are all clean I, 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 I cut all my stems onto the counter and then I clean it every so often into the garbage can so my space is generally pretty clean um, but that's that's pretty much how we do our bouquets okay so now into the flowers themselves dahlias I live in um, conventional bean and corn country we have serious um, insect pressure by the northern corn rootworm beetle and the Japanese beetles the northern corn rootworm beetle is a little green uh, cucumber beetle that um, and, and as well as you all know Japanese beetles they both shred the dahlia petals and just render them useless um, so and I tried I you know tried growing them in, in tunnels without this screening but I finally decided that I was going to screen my tunnels and I haven't had the insect pressure um, since then I do use uh, a 40 and 50 mesh insect screen you could get by with less you don't really need 50 50 keeps thrips out but as you may or may not know thrips their life cycle is basically soil to plant and back down to soil again so you're not really getting a lot of pressure from outside from the thrips it's coming from the soil um, and the one important thing with putting this insect screening up is it really limits um, airflow so you know you can have some issues there but a 40 would would um, keep keep both of those insects out in this last year um, if you remember I did not have dahlias up on my top 10 we have we had a flood um, which we so often get you know four or five inches in a half an hour that's the way I, we get our rain and the dahlia house flooded and dahlias do not like to be underwater for any more than about a half a minute and my entire dahlia crop went away in a day and they were just put onto the availability list and I was just about to start cutting so it was horrible so this year we've um, we've banked up the soil about six inches and I've dug a swale a big swale um, so hopefully I won't have that problem and in the house we generally um, space them two feet apart within the row and then about three feet between the rows each one of the um, dahlias get a, a T post or a rebar and then we tie them to that post individually I've tried netting I've tried all kinds of things and this is the best way that we've found they generally have to get um, tied two or three times uh, I just use the regular you know like two ply jute twine when I plant um, we fertilize with a sustain 464 it's a composted turkey manure um, and I do fertigate I see some questions quickly here um, the I don't have voles I have cats I, I have three cats on the farm um, so they take a lot of a good care of my my vole problem and the dahlia house I'm talking about is a 10 by 90 96 a 20 by 96 and the, it's about a 12 foot high roof um, 
We use predaceous mites for thrips control. There's two different mites that I put in the soil and monitor carefully for powdery mildew. Um, the trick with powdery mildew, we don't, you, we grow pretty much organically. We were certified organic for many years and when we switched from uh, starter plants to only flowers, I quit doing the certification, but we haven't really changed our growing practices. So uh, with powdery mildew control, you have to be, you can't cure, there's no curative in an organic system, so you've got to prevent. So we use cease mycotrol and oxidate and rotate those. Um, we harvest in five stem bunches. We do not sear them. We put them directly into water. We use a GERB pill, which is a CVBN tablet from Chrysol. They're kind of spendy, but what it is is a slow-release bleach. And you know that you need a sanitizing um, element in your, your flower solution. Uh, the other thing that really has changed our quality is since we were certified organic, um, you know, there's no good floral preservatives in the organic system. And since we're no longer organic, I can use um, some of the commercial products and it makes a huge difference in our, in our products. Um, and then we, we, we wholesale them from anywhere from $10 to $13 a bunch. We also sell them in cases for $100 a case. And I have done the, the square foot studies on this that we have earned well over $3 a square foot for dahlias. So it's a pretty good bang for your buck. Um, okay, so here's a picture of the dahlia house. Um, you can see in the front that there's no dahlias. That was from, from some minor flooding. Hopefully this year we won't have that problem. We do put um, landscape fabric down on everything. Uh, you know, it took a long time for me to figure that out, but I do put it down. I take it up every year. Um, the irrigation is underneath. Um, all of our crops are irrigated on timers, so I don't have to remember because I will forget. I'll leave them on too long. I won't turn them on, you know, whatever. Um, the reason, Billy, for no longer certifying is that um, it's a real <laughs> arduous task to go through the audit. I grow in two different farms, one in Wisconsin and one in um, Stockton, and I mix the flowers, and I was not certifying the flowers in Wisconsin, and the audit trail was almost impossible for us to uh, complete so it, it was it just didn't make any sense anymore so that that's why we no longer certified okay number four is ranunculus um we have a really long ranunculus season i have um two heated houses one permanent greenhouse it's a permanent structure and then I also have another house that I call a box house, my box house, and you'll see pictures of it um, in a little bit. Both of them are heated. So my first crop um, is planted in, in, a, in the next few weeks. I haven't started it yet, but um, when this is all, now that I'm finished with the webinar, um, I'll probably start the pre-germination process. Um, Ah, the cat's coming again. You out of here. Sorry about that. Am I still on? Yes. Um, okay, so uh, the ranunculus need a pre-germination process. And the way we do that is we soak the... If you buy the, the corms from Gleckner, they will include excellent instructions. Um, so I hope I'm not you know, telling you something you already know, but they need to be soaked in, in water with some kind of a fungicide. We use Oxidate, and they need to be in aerated water. Um, the way I do it is I, I have about eight different places that I can run water in my, between my greenhouse and my garden center. 
So I leave the water dripping over each of the buckets so I can get more done at once. Um, but they soak in an oxidate solution for four hours. And then I, I wrap them in a, a, a bundle of cheesecloth and then put that bundle of cheesecloth in a five-gallon bucket and run the water. And then the, the water drips just lightly to keep the, the water moving. Um, after they've been soaked, um, pull it out of the five-gallon bucket, and I lay the, the roots on a, a 1020 tray of vermiculite, and then I lightly cover them with vermiculite, and I moisten it with another oxidate solution, and I dome them, and I keep them on a cart in my garden center. So it's about 50 to 60 degrees. I say keep dark. I don't mean dark as in in the cooler or blacked out. It's just out of the sunlight. Um, and I, and I, it just keeps them cooler. Rather than putting them in the greenhouse where there's lots of bench space, it just gets too warm for them and they'll dry out. You do want to keep them about 50 to 60 degrees. It takes about 10 days for them to root. Um, you really should check them daily and remove all of the corms that are getting furry. They will, you know, they're, they're grown in the soil and they're, when, once you rehydrate them, the, the, fungus, the fungus, fungus start growing and it'll just turn, the, the, turn them to mush. So you want to remove those. And then um, we plant about an inch and a half to two inches we add, we top dress the bed with sustain and actinovate, which is a biological fungicide. Um, a streptomyces fun fungus is the active ingredient. Um, there's a, another product called actino iron. There's one called uh, First Amendment, but they all have the streptomyces um, as their active ingredient. Um, we plant into the box house, which is minim minimally heated. I keep the thermostat at about 35 degrees, 34. Um, bulb crates work fine. I put about uh, 12 per bulb crate. Um, plants are very tolerant of cold, so you don't have to baby them. Um, you really don't. Um, I wanted to see, I didn't say how I plant the, so I plant them about two to three inches apart in the row and about um, six inches apart within the, uh, between rows. So they're about, I don't know, what is that, three to four inches on center. Okay, so cutting them, you want to cut them when the bud is puffy, just beginning to show true color. Um, they last a really long time in the cooler. Um, it's much better to harvest them at the puffy bud stage rather than to let them stay on the plant and open up in the heat. Um, one of my colleagues, Joe Schmidt, who some of you may have heard speak or heard of, um, he's a third generation cut flower grower. He would always stay. It's better to keep the plants on the vine than cut them and keep them in the cooler. Well, that is true for most things, but not with ranunculus. These puppies will stay well in the cooler for three or four weeks if they're cut in that bud stage. And when it's warm, they open really fast. So we have to end up cutting them twice a day. Um, so we saved the roots. We started that a couple years ago. Um, I don't know why we didn't do it all the time, but uh, it's real important to label the colors because once you finish cutting them, you're not going to remember what color they are. And um, you want to let the plants dry up and the foliage turn yellow before you dig them, if possible. You don't want to dig them when they're uh, growing, actively growing. And you don't want to dig them when they're wet because the dirt um, adheres to these and you'll end up with a big muddy blob. And 
you also are this is in uh, the first part of June when you know everything is going on you're super busy and you don't really want to clean them um, and we don't usually clean them then but you want to store them in a labeled bulb crate um, and let them dry out we just stack them in the um, in my garage keep them from freezing and thawing and then when you're about ready to plant again it was probably in you know beginning of November end of September or October when we cleaned them and I use the you know brass shut off without the nozzle and get a good hard spray and just clean them really really well and then let them dry again and then this week I will start the pre-germination period Okay, succulents. We do a lot of succulents. Um, I put them in gardens, four and six inch, uh, and eight inch actually, but we sell mostly four and six inch uh, succulents. Um, I get the the pots. They're just simple clay pots. You can see I don't get the fancy ones. Um, I get them from Ceramo. They do have a five hundred dollar minimum, which is uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of pots because these four the pots are four inch pots are about twenty cents. Six inch pots are you know maybe forty some cents, and the eight inch pots are a little over a dollar. So that's a lot of pots for five hundred dollars. Um, we buy in cuttings and plant them. We buy in two and three inch finished, and we propagate a whole lot of ours. They're really easy to propagate. Um, this winter, we keep the thermostats at about 35, and they're grown under lights. So they survive. They don't necessarily thrive in the winter. Um, but they I don't take them outside. They stay in the greenhouse all year long. Um, the biggest pest problem is mealybugs, and they're just rampant on succulents and I I didn't write this down but I use uh, a combination of the Tanagard and Moltex um, and alcohol uh, the alcohol is just um, rubbing alcohol and q-tips when you see uh, a, a small infestation you can just clean them individually uh, some succulents are a lot more prone to melees than others. We just use a uh, um, pro mix. I use a pro mix um, with mycorrhizae for for um, our potting media. I don't bump it up with sand. The gardens are delivered moist um, and we sell them in cases of uh, the, the four inch go in cases of 12, the six inch go in cases of six, and then the four the eight inch go in in cases of four and generally that's determined by how I transport them um, and I again you want to if you end up doing something like this you want to be able to transport them so that you go over a bump you slam on the brakes you have to do a tight turn they're not going to get trashed um, the Generally, they're three to four small succulents in the four inch. Generally, three to five in the in the six inch. We usually have at least one large one in the six inch, and then generally all much larger ones in the eight inch. Um, we sell them for five ninety five, eight ninety five, and fourteen ninety five. Um, and then we use broken glass that I get from a company called Close the Loop in they're out of Pennsylvania. They recycle glass and they you know they kind of tumble it in acid so that it's broken and it's kind of a, a, a cheap uh, beach glass just to uh, you know pop the colors a little bit, make them a little bit different. Okay, Lysianthus. Um, this is Lisa Larson of Sunborn Gardens. Um, may have, you may have met her, I don't know, but these are Lizzie's. Um, 
We have grown and continue to grow a lot of our own Lysianthus from seed, and we'll talk about that. And this year, I'm going to be purchasing um, probably about half the crop of plugs. Um, and that's just because Lysianthus are really, really slow growing. And with that, there's a number of issues that happen. But um, generally, uh, and back to the, the certified organic, it's really hard to find uncoated, unpelleted Lizzie's. And I, I have been able, I had been able to find them. Um, and they're such small seeds. Now that I'm no longer certified organic, all of the Lizzie seed that I buy is pelleted, so it's really easy to see. So I put two seeds per cell in a 200 cell tray. They're germinated under lights. They're not covered. Um, Lizzie's like light to germinate. I, I try to bottom water either with capillary mats or dipping them into a, actually the, the tray fits into a bulb crate if I put a big garbage bag, um, a great big garbage can, or, yeah, liner um, in the bulb crate and then, you know, tamp it down and fill it with water and then I can just drop the, the tray into bottom water. And then as soon, it takes about 21 to 30 days for them to germinate. When they have their first set of true leaves, I transplant them into a 128. These are very, very tiny. Um, and again, they're slow growing. Then by, the, by March, um, you want to get them planted. Um, this year, one of the reasons why I'm buying the plugs is because I want to be able to plant by the first week of March, end of February. And um, it's just too hard for me to get those seedlings finished that early. Um, and the reason why you want to do that is so that you get a rebloom in September. Um, so what so by planting early, ones and twos, um, like snapdragons, Lizzie's are numbered 1, 2, 3, and 4, and that has to do with their bloom time. Um, so 1's and 2's are winter and early spring. You plant those then, and they will bloom for us early. And then they will rebloom in September. If you don't plant your Lizzie's until March, April, late March, April, you're only going to generally get one bloom. And it's a teaser because they'll bud up and then they won't open. It just gets too late for them to open. There's not enough light. Um, the sun is too low. So by planting end of February and or first of March and end of March, first of April, then we should have um, Lizzie's from June until September. We plant or we sell them in. Um, half pound bunches for $15, $14.95. And each bunch has about 18 to 20 flowers. The second, the rebloom will likely be one flower per stem. So um, you're going to be putting a lot more stems in your late, your rebloom bunches. You want to try to cut those first stems when there's three to four flowers open, and you'll probably need to deadhead that first flower. Okay, peonies. Um, whenever you're planting new crops of peonies, you're going to have to wait three years. Um, you should probably cut the flowers off um, so that they put more energy into the roots. Um, we harvest at the marshmallow or puffy bud stage, and th those that actually these are all almost past that um, in this picture. You can see some of them are in that stage, the smaller buds, but most of these I would have put into water for bouquets or selling as uh, bunches uh, immediately. Um, so we, we uh, dry store our peonies so that I get four to six weeks out of my peony crop. 
Um, the if you cut them in the puffy bud stage, they have to be dry. You don't want to put them in the cooler when they're wet. So you remove almost all of the leaves and select, you know, the, the nicest buds for storage. I wrap five at a time in a single piece of newspaper. I use the blue painter's tape because I will be going back into that package and you can reseal it. Label them carefully with um, the color, the, or, or if you know what the name is, um, how many stems, and the date that you put it in. And then I keep a log of all the peonies um, with that, much, that information as well so that if a florist calls me and says, do you have, and then once I sell them, I cross them off my log. Do you have 150 stems of, of white? I can go through and look without having to go into count, into the cooler and open them up and count. As I said, they will generally store four to six um, weeks. The singles don't store as well as the doubles. Um, to rehydrate, all you have to do is give them a fresh cut and put them in water. Um, we do use uh, GURB pills and the um, holding solution in our water. Um, you know, the florists primarily want the white, blush, pink, and some coral charm. Once in a while, true red, uh, sometimes the, the dark pink or the hot pink. Um, so I would caution you against buying the really expensive ones. Um, you know, put those in your garden. But, but y y there, there's, there's lots of literature on which, which colors, which varieties will give you the best stems and the strongest stems. And you really shouldn't have to pay more than three or four bucks um, for, a, for a peony root. OK, delivery. Um, you saw that I put delivery down. I did that because it it keeps going to my top ten. Um, the first year, I've, this is only the second year I've charged delivery. The first year I charged seven dollars, and this last year I bumped it up to ten dollars. There was no issues with the customers. Um, just don't be afraid to charge delivery. We don't have a refrigerated truck. Um, we have a big, um, it's a new, uh, we just got a new van, it's a Ford Transit, uh, extended length. Um, it's not one that you can, it's not extended height, you can't walk into it and stand up. But um, the, you know, we don't store anything in our truck overnight. Um, we deliver everything the same day and the air conditioning does reach the back of the truck. Um, the picture is, um, I belong to a, a cooperative of eight different cut flower growers that market collectively in Madison and Milwaukee. And this is a picture of our truck on any given day. Um, these are generally on consignment. Um, so the florist comes in and picks whatever bunches she wants and we have a computer um, on the truck, they're, they have a, a barcode, or they're, they're tagged so that um, the, the salesperson knows who grew what, and, and, and so we all get paid accordingly. But that's this truck. Our truck has only bunches that are labeled for each florist. Um, it's, you know, I have a purchase order or a, a firm order for all the stuff that I deliver. We deliver in Chicago, so it's about a three-hour drive. So I don't take anything on consignment. OK, poppies. Um, this was last year, or this year was the first year we grew poppies. Here's a, um, this is the stage of uh, the puffy bud I was talking about for ranunculus. OK, so it's, it's pretty tight. Um, and then these are, and then there's poppies in each one of these pictures. Um, so we buy in plugs from Grow and Sell, and they will come in week 52, which is uh, the week of Christmas. No, that's the last week of the year. So um, yeah, which is Christmas. Um, we'll be planting them, uh, you know, as soon as possible. 
We plant them in the box house, which I have a picture of. I'll show you in a half a minute. Um, two to three inches between the plants and then six inches between the row. They're planted on either side of the drip tape. Uh, we, again, we add the same um, amendments when we plant. Um, our box house is equipped with raised beds. Um, it does have minimum heat. The end walls and the side walls have the insect netting because I also grow dahlias in here. I grow cosmos and other uh, scabiosa, things that the bugs shred, and I can't grow them outside. Um, there's four high airflow fans installed to increase circulation. Um, remember that the netting does decrease airflow. Um, the insect netting, Karen, you can get from, uh, I don't know if you guys buy through BFG. Um, I get it through them. Green Tech is the manufacturer, um, but I don't know that you can buy directly from Green Tech. Um, let's see, da, 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 da. powdery mildew is a huge problem in these um, screened tunnels. So you really have to watch carefully and spray as soon as you see them. Um, so the poppies begin blooming at the end of March and they bloom through May and into June. They are um, amazingly prolific. There were probably, I didn't count, but each plant probably got eight to ten flowers on each plant. Huge amount, um, huge amount. So this is very important. When you cut the poppies, you cut them, and I have a picture, I think the next picture will show you the stage to cut them, but you want to sear the ends. And what we used is a, um, my husband is a chef and does catering, and so we have these single burner um, portable stoves. And we just, every time we would have a, a whole bunch of poppies in our hand, fire up the burner and sear the ends, and then put them into the water. And at the right stage, um, they last a long time, two, three weeks in the cooler. And the, the re real reason why we cut them at the bud stage is for success in transporting. They're real uh, wiry, funky stems, and if the flower is open, the petals will bruise by the time the florist gets them. So this is a picture of the boxes that I keep talking about in my box house. Um, the reason why this tunnel was, was, I did it like this is because under the, the floor of the tunnel is about 24 inches of road gravel, and I knew that I would never be able to get that fluff fluffy soil back um, from excavation. So um, these are all irrigated. They're, I've given us just barely enough space to walk in between each box. Um, when they have cafe au lait dahlias in them, let me tell you, it's tight. But so these are the poppies. This was, I think that was January 1st. OK, so here's the way um, you want to cut your poppies. You can see just barely color, and the sepals are, um, the calyx is still attached. OK, see this one? This one, the calyx has fallen off, but that's still OK. And then again, here's the stage of the ranunculus that you want to cut. And then these are some anemones. You also want to cut them um, somewhat closed. OK, so. Number 10, stock. Um, we grow stock in the spring and in the fall. And I think most everybody in, included in this group should be able to do a fall crop. Um, you need cooler weather in September and October. So New Jersey might be a little warm. I don't know. Um, Kansas is probably too warm to do a fall crop. but um, so we sow uh, the spring, February is when I'll start. It's always two seeds per cell for, um, for the two or three seeds. Um, I'll go into that in a minute here. But I'll uh, plant them as early as I can in the tunnel in March. 
uh, or early April. Um, I'll do them inside the tunnel or outside, and then I'll use a low tunnel with Remay to cover them. Um, stock does fine outside, so don't be afraid to put stock outside. If you don't have a tunnel, don't be afraid to grow stock. I wouldn't grow. I wouldn't suggest Lizzie's outside, but some people do that successfully as well, but um, I haven't had that good a luck with Lizzie's outside. Um, our fall crop we seed in mid-July and plant it in August. It's really hot in August, and so I put row cover again on them as soon as I've planted them just to give them a little bit of shade, um, light, really light uh, remay. Um, water them really, really well. It's, it's, like I said, it's hot in August, and they look horrible once they've been planted, but they all seem to recover. So the spring crop will bloom late May through June. They don't like it warm. Um, fall crop will start mid-September and go into November. They are very cold tolerant. They're cabbages. Um, if you haven't already, be sure you eat a stock flower. Tastes just like a radish. They're very edible. Um, you want to cut the flowers when they're one-third to a half open. They're spikes, so just like stock uh, or like um, foxglove and snapdragons, they're very heavy feeders. You'll definitely want to store them in a holding solution. They'll store in the cooler for a couple weeks, not, not forever. I generally choose varieties with a high percent doubles. And so that's going to be the Cheerful Series and the Japanese High Doubles. Um, we don't select the doubles out at the Cotyledon stage. You can do that. I, I just don't have the time to do it. Um, we don't use the singles at bloom time. You can, but they're just the, the, the petals fall really fast, and um, we, we do not. So with uh, the Cheerful Series, um, we plant, and, and the Japanese high doubles, we plant two seeds per cell with the, uh, if I do cats, which are 50, 55% double, I plant three seeds per cell. And um, that way I have a really good chance of getting doubles. And, and that's what you want. So, um, we support all of our flowers. This is a picture of um, a fall crop of stock. Um, you can see here this masonry, this caging here. I, I hope you can see it. It's masonry wire, five foot masonry wire that's folded uh, twice. So there's a foot by three feet and then another foot. They're on six inch. You can see um, the six inch squares in here if you look carefully. Um, we use a lot of these cages. The, I, I, I wanted to say like for, um, I don't know if any of you grow Godisha. They're really fussy to grow. <laughs> I'm not really crazy about them, but I grow them. Um, with the Godisha, I, I put a, um, at this six inch level, I will zip tie Hortnova fabric and then I will use these bows and I'll put, so then I have a six inch, a 12 inch, and I'll use Hortnova fabric, um, you know, up across here so that the Godisha have three layers of support. The stock usually only gets one. Um, my flowering kale will get two, again, using the the, the mesh here and the and then I'll put the bows up and netting and then the bows here are tall enough that I can put remay over them without only one layer without them getting um, to, to prevent from frost damage uh, so I think that's a wrap yep we're done um, so, questions? Awesome, Jeannie. Thank you very much. There's a lot of good detail there. <laughs> sure. Um, so I was kind of trying to keep track. Maybe you had answered some of these and I missed it, but I'm going to go back uh, a little ways into the chat box. 
And if you've got questions okay. now for Jenny, go ahead and put them in there. We've got plenty of time here. Um, but back, and I can't remember the context of this, but Carl had asked early in the presentation, um, you had mentioned using the cooler. Do you know what you what your cooler temperature is at? 38. Okay, and that's pretty consistent for 30. all varieties? You use the same? Yeah, um, it's consistent for most varieties. We do put our zinnias in that cooler. Most people don't put zinnias in the cooler, or if they have a cooler that will stay at about 45, that's what they do, but I've not had a problem with zinnias in the cooler. Um, we have two coolers. We have one with the, the regular um, floral evaporator, and then I have a cool bot, and um, both of them are about 38 to 40 degrees, and um, so that that's what ours are. Okay. Um, the next one I don't think we've addressed was you had mentioned using an insect screen. And could you mention a little bit of detail about that, where you get it, what kind of type you use, or anything like that? Yeah, okay. So I, I quickly told somebody, it, it's made by Green Tech. I get it through BFG Nursery Supply. The 40, I use 40 and 50 mesh screening, and that's 40, um, 40 squares per inch, I think it is, or 50 squares per inch. So it's very small holes. Um, Green Tech is the uh, manufacturer, and they're actually in Janesville, Wisconsin. Um, the reason why I went to the two different sizes was one comes in a six foot I don't know, six foot three inch or something like that, and then one comes in a 13 foot. And it was just cheaper for me to use that six foot for the end on the side walls and the 13 for the end walls. Um, I don't think you really need the 50. The 50 keeps thrips out, but as I said, thrips don't generally fly in from outside. They, they, uh, the larvae are in the soil, and when they, uh, they have two or three um, molts and then they, the adults fly up into the plant. So you have to control the thrips from either the flower or the soil. It, it, does that help? Yeah, I think we can see if in, there's any comments okay. about that, but I think that covers it. Um, so, so then, Jeannie, I guess going down the line, then the next question that I you did talk about uh, your reasons for not certifying organic any longer, but then uh, Billy's follow-up question was about your markets and was there? Did you notice any difference? Um, you know, not certifying uh, your flowers to be no, organic in I your did markets. Not. That doesn't affect your market at all. There's no premium no, it, there or anything like did, that. It did not affect my market at all. Okay. It it absolutely didn't. The only. Uh, you know, the one time that I was, uh, I sell a lot to Whole Foods, and um, I had one of my customers, um, and I deal with the florists um, who, who buy, you know, but one of their customers was a cancer survivor and is was immunocompromised, and she couldn't handle flowers that have been treated with fungicide and all flowers are treated with fungicide unless they're grown organically um, and that's dipped in fungicide so she asked for certified organic flowers um, but you know in reality none of my flowers are dipped in fungicides they they do that when they have to travel um, you know from other countries Yep. Okay, so uh, back when so you were, next. yeah, back when you were talking about the, pardon my butchering of this, ranunculus is that how you'd say it? Uh huh. Yeah. So the ranunculus, uh, as far as propagating those, Kathy had asked, have you let any grow onto more of a transplant stage before planting them outdoors? Um. So. I'm guessing that you ask that question because um, it's too cold outside or some such. But 
if you I have let them green up a little bit but generally you want to plant them when they're rooted um, and so they don't have a lot of leaf material on the top I hope that answers your question or you can ask it a little bit you know ask again but uh, the other thing too if you have more questions feel free to email me I don't know um, I can put my email or Steve can post it, but um, you can we can take this offline for more information. But generally, no, I plant them rooted. So there's roots coming out of the bottom, and they've all sprouted somewhat um, out the top. So I know they're alive, and there's no fuzziness on them. Yep, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So Kathy, if you have a follow up on that question that you asked, you can ask you can add that in here. Um, and the next one, Jeannie, was when you were talking about succulents, and maybe I'll maybe I'll um, scoot the slides back. But you were talking about succulents and the prices, and Billy wanted to clarify that those are wholesale prices. I think everything you've been talking about is Correct. wholesale, right? Yeah, it's all wholesale. Yeah. I don't have any retail markets. Okay, yep. So yep. there was another. So they will retail them. They'll double those prices. Mm -hmm. Generally. Right. So if anybody's thinking about doing this stuff for farmers market, like there was a question about whether or not you sell these at market. Um, that might be a good, right, I good indicator then that these are wholesale prices. Yeah, and I don't. Know, it, yeah, and it depends on your market whether or not you can get um, that much. You know, get twelve dollars for a four inch. I, I doubt you could, but you could certainly get eight or nine. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then then you were talking about the Lizzies. Um, okay. And there was a question that if it, when you would plant those out in March. Is that in a hoop house or yeah. in the field? Uh, they'll all be in in hoop houses. Okay. Um, when I plant in February, it's going to be in a minimally heated house. But uh, by February, I shouldn't have to have the heat on. Um, but there, I do all my lizzies in houses. I don't plant them out in the field. They get water spotted. They're shorter. Um, I I just don't have good luck with them outside. Okay. So related to that, then Clara has a question. That's uh, she's wondering about what your favorites are for field grown for someone who might not have access to a hoop house at this point. Do you have any? Do you have a, so a you, couple of that you could recommend for outdoor? I could recommend not doing the purple. The purple get water spotted really badly. Um, so I have done white and um, like a blue rimmed one pretty successfully, but pick just stay away from the 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 blues or purples um, dark the dark purples because they get water spotted and they're just they're, they're they just don't look pretty at all and are you talking a specific variety or just in general in general okay. in general and I I would take it offline she can email me and I can give her some um, specific varieties that would work well uh, in her area okay great and I did by the way Jeannie just post your okay. email uh, email address yeah. in there so. that, that works great okay perfect um, let's see so okay uh, there's another question about the zinnias um, how about zinnias? Good market for giants in a variety of colors. Do you what kind, do you mess with zinnias much? And what's your experience and opinion? Yeah, so we we grow the Benari hybrids, um, the Benari with the dahlia giant dahlias, um, and I don't do the white or the lime in the Benari giants. Um, we do pretty much all color, not all colors. I think there's probably six different reds. Um, I do a couple of different reds, and definitely orange and yellow. Uh, the corals and the salmons are really um, sought after for wedding work. Um, then we also do the Oklahomas. We call them Okies, and the ivory is really now. Actually, this year I see that ivory is not offered, um, at least in the geo catalog. Um, so I'll probably do white. Um, the Oklahomas are much smaller. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We do uh, the violet, a little bit of red, and uh, some yellow. And 
then the ivory is a lot of ivory of the Oklahomas. And then we also do, um, I did the Upper Row Rose this year. I, I, I don't really think it's worth the money personally. The lime, the queen lime, queen red lime, and queen lime blotch, um, they're okay. They, um, they don't, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to do them again. They're kind of spendy and um, there tend to be a lot of singles in them and, and I just, I'm not crazy about that. But but generally Oklahoma's, and then we also do the cactus mix, um, the state fair cactus mix. There's some really, really nice, um, again, blushy salmon ones for wedding work. Great. Uh, so the next one that I see on the list here is, I know we obviously we're just covering the, the top sellers, so we didn't get into this much, but do you have any good recommendations for a favorite greenery or filler that you like to use? Yeah, I do. And actually, if we went to the very first slide again, and I think you guys can access it um, online, but um, down down uh, you'll see that yeah go to the okay so uh, nope next go back up to the very yeah there you go okay so in um, let's see in 2016 down below Celosia it says bunch that is scented geraniums and if you look in 2017 again the 10 per bunch down below hydrangeas that's scented hydrangeas or scented geraniums too. Scented geraniums are a fabulous greenery. We also do, and if you have questions about those, um, you know, ask me offline. Um, we also do. Uh, I have a lot of nine bark planted. Um, I have. Let's see what else we we plant a lot of bupleurum. We do, um, we cut, uh, we ditch, you know, uh, ditch cut um, the, the solidago, the goldenrod, before it blooms. For it's, that's a great greenery. Um, we cut it in the ditches. Uh, let's see, what else? Nine bark. Um, we use peony foliage, especially if you guys are just starting to grow peonies. Um, and you can't use the flowers, the peony foliage is fantastic. I've got both the Diablo, the dark nine bark, and I've got green nine bark. We cut forsythia. Um, oh gosh, we just privet. Lots and lots of different greeneries. Eucalyptus we plant. Every year we plant from seed. Uh, we do eucalyptus. We have a lot of rosemary because I have a greenhouse. I keep rosemary growing all the time. We use rosemary upright and um, the prostrate. So that should be a few anyway to get you started. Uh, let's see mm -hmm. what else. Yep. Greenery. And then Mary I can see. Oh, she wanted to see the pictures of the puffy bud stage of, let's see, the peonies. I was going to see if I have a... So this is not the puffy bud stage. They're beautiful, but this is uh, a little bit too late, really, if you wanted to store them in the cooler for ranunculus. So I would call some of these over here that are smaller, maybe that one, but, but these that are open up more, they're, they're too far open, okay? They're, they're, they're just too far open. So what I mean by the puffy bud stage is I take my thumb and forefinger and go through and squeeze. And if it squeezes like a marshmallow, I cut it. And I do that twice a day. Um, let's see what else. Okay, so then the ranunculus puffy bud stage is here. That's a puffy bud. 
okay? This is a puffy bud. So that's a perfect puffy bud. Um, I think that's it. Tunnel frames. How tall? Are, okay, so I have a 14, a 12, and an 11 foot tunnel. And two of my tunnels are 30 by 96, and one of them is 20 by 96. And but all three of them have about their the hip boards are about five and a half feet high, um, and they're straight side so that I can plant all the way to the edge. And I wonder if uh, if Carl was let me pull this next. You had a, another slide, you know, when wh where you had the masonry wire here. I wonder if maybe Carl was referencing these short low tunnels. Uh, he maybe was referencing your high um, tunnels, but is this just three feet tall or oh, something okay. at Apex? Oh, okay. Sorry. This is a ten foot. Um, no, it's about eh, three, maybe a little bit higher. It's a ten foot conduit, and I can actually send you a some specifications for that, Carl. Uh, yeah, Carl. If if um, you know where to make the 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 use a pipe bender, so where to make the bends in the bows, I can do that. But yeah, it's about three feet. Well, it would be it's a little bit higher than that because it's a ten foot um, bow and it street stretches forty two inches. Okay. And how many years? Two. You should really wait three years for your peonies. How many years do you expect a peony to produce? Oh gosh, forever. <laughs> Unless you need to move them and then you gotta wait a year or two. But they la long, long, long time. Yeah, peonies are one of those, you know, forever kind of plants. Um my farm is, I grow on two different locations, and I grow on a total of about two acres. Um, I have four houses. One is a greenhouse that I, um, I have rolling benches in them, and I've actually removed some of the benches, so I have more growing space on the ground where I grow in crates or containers. Um, and then three that I grow... Uh, only flowers in, and uh, one is that box house, so it's in raised beds, and then the other two are in the ground. And I think that's it. Yeah. Do I save my seed? I do not. Um, there's the final list. Yeah, I don't save seed. Um, you know, there's uh, I save dahlias and I save ranunculus, uh, and that's about it. Um, the thing is with seeds, I grow mostly F1 hybrids, and and saving them is a waste of time because you're not going to get the same plant out of them. So the only ones that you would save would be the open pollinated types. Um, you know, many of these many of these don't even produce seed, so uh, you know, basically, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, so there was one question about this being this uh, being recorded and archived, and it and it is being recorded, and we'll have it at, at practicalfarmers.org on our farm and our archive. It's pretty easy to find, so um, definitely go back through this if you'd like. Um, Let's see. Yeah, and then Karen, this is the top ten list that she has just went through. So this is the list. I don't know if we're missing anything else. Okay, Mary's got a new question. Oh, here's just yeah on the dahlia yep. tubers. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we dig them once once they've frozen um, a hard frost. So they stay in the ground until a hard frost, and then they're dug, and we clean them. Um, well, we don't scrub them. I don't clean them spotless, but I clean them well. 
um, and try to remove all the dirt. And then I bring them into the greenhouse or some place that I have room. And by that time of the year, I, it's the greenhouse. I let them dry, dry, you know, all the soil on them dry. And then I try to remove more of the soil so that they're pretty clean. And then, um, and, and I've been doing this for a long time. And I, every year for a while, I would try something else. And this has been the best so far. I'll put, I'll use bulb crates, put a piece of newspaper down at the bottom, put the dahlias in, make sure they're labeled. And if you're going to label, if you're going to put, you know, you're going to want to label them before they quit blooming. Same like with the ranunculus. Um, and you might want to label them with, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, the mice. One year we labeled them with um, flagging tape. And by the time we went back to dig them, the mice had chewed all the flagging tape and there were nests used. So there were bright red and orange mouse nests. So you want to get use something that the mice aren't going to use to label them. And then um, uh, then I, I put them in the bulb crate. I don't pack them real full. And then I use um, cedar shavings. And you can get bales of cedar shavings. Walmart.com, not that I want to support Walmart, but um, they were the cheapest. And you might be able to get them at your local feed store because I think goats, I think there's, you know, certain animals use cedar shavings. But then I cover it with cedar shavings. I first dust them with sulfur and then cover them with cedar shavings. And the cedar also has some um, fungicidal properties. And then I put them in my cooler that's off and it's dark and stays about 40 degrees in there. And I get pretty darn good results. Uh, the reason for waiting for a freeze is that's what the literature says. Um, and it's interesting, but if you catch them soon enough, I don't divide them, by the way, but if you catch them soon enough, right after the freeze, you will see the eyes. The eyes will have like a little bulge to them. So if you can get all of this done fast enough, you can do your divisions knowing that you're going to have a good eye um, right away. So, great. Well, looks like uh, we've uh, we've pretty much reached right to the end of our time, and I think uh, we've exhausted all the questions in the chat box. So, it's a good time to wrap up. Cool. Um, yeah, everybody, one more plug. I did put the link in the chat box to take that survey. Let us know what topics you want to hear about in the future. Let us know what you thought about tonight. Um, but thanks for joining us. And Jeannie, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and, and tell us about what works for you. And this is this was really great well, and informative. Thank you all so much. It's It was fun. Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, thanks for allowing for the further uh, the the questions. So we we've got your email address in the chat box. If anybody wants to follow yeah, absolutely. up, with her. not a problem. Cool, that's great. Okay. Well, everybody. Good night, everybody. Yeah, have a great night. Thanks for joining.